So here we are. This is my talk, Stratify Design, a Lisp Tradition. Um, I'm, I talk ab about this in my book and I did a lot of research for this for my book. Uh, I thought I'd just mention that if you're interested in maybe a more practical view of how to apply stratified design that I'm going to go into today, uh, you, should, you should check it out. There's two chapters dedicated to this. All right, so I, I have some questions uh, that I you know, it's like a project of mine to answer these questions over my lifetime. Um, and here, it's hard to, you know, this is like something that I'm just very curious about and I, I want to understand better. And so it's sometimes hard to express the question, the, the full breadth of the question in English, because when I say stuff like how do computers even work, it sounds like I'm asking like, how do NAND gates fit together to form a, a, a Turing complete circuit? You know, I'm, and I'm kind of asking that, but something a lot broader, like how, how is it that this circuit that's nothing but electrons flowing around in this very complex way is able to do useful work, useful for us as humans, as, 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 you know, people with, with needs in, you know, biological needs, we have to eat, we have to breathe, and we can get these computers to help us do a lot of this stuff. How is that possible? It's, it's just electrons, right? And likewise, what is programming? We write code and it's just bytes on a disk at some point when you, you know, you save your code to disk, but then somehow it's instructions for a machine to help us do this stuff that we needed to do. You know, what is computation? I'm trying to pinpoint at this, at this bigger, broader question of what is it that we actually do as programmers, as software engineers building real systems? This is a slide from um, Alan Kay. Uh, one of his, his talks, a recent talk where he was interviewed by Joe Armstrong. And he has this thing, his talks are always very, very much about this. But he has this thing like right in the middle here, this little oval, a computer is a universal atom of meaning. So this idea of a universal atom of meaning is really interesting, but it's very abstract. And so we need to make this a little bit more practical and look at one way that computers can add meaning to essentially meaningless signals. Okay, so let's look at an example of a web server listening on port 80 and some other machine, a client, connects to the WebSocket at port 80 and starts sending in some bytes. Okay, so those bytes aren't very meaningful by themselves. Uh, well, they're not meaningful without interpretation. So all the meaning is in there. We know that all the information is in those bytes, but we need to start going through different levels of interpretation to to make that meaning available. So the first step we'll do is we'll parse it or we'll decode it as UTF-8 and turn those bytes into characters. That's one level of interpretation. We're accessing a deeper meaning. And of course, it's gonna look like an HTTP request, so we'll wanna parse that HTTP request. And so now we'll have some headers and a body that's what HTTP requests are made of. And, but still, now we need to understand what is this HTTP request all about? So we do what is often called routing. And that will give us, this one happens to be, because we're doing a post to slash users, it happens to be a user recreate, create, creation request. And so the body is gonna have some JSON. Of course, JSON is just text, so we need to parse that. Another level of interpretation and that gives us data structures. 
Okay, and we also know what to do with it. We know what we're kind of expecting to find in that data structure. So we're gonna interpret it again. We'll call this step validate. And it's gonna validate that we have a user creation request record. Good job, Renzo, on those slides. Um, now notice we've, we've, we haven't added the meaning, that's not the right word, but we've uncovered the meaning. The meaning was always there, even in the bytes, it was there. It just wasn't accessible in a convenient way. And so we've, one thing the computer is doing to, in, it, to add meaning, to uncover meaning, to make the meaning available, is it is interpreting in multiple levels uh, this, these bytes that are coming in. Right, and we can go down further. Bytes is not the lowest level. You know, down further, it's it's packets, and then below that, it's uh, it's pulses of of electromagnetic <laughs> radiation going through the wires. It's uh, it, it, you know we can go further and further down. And the TCPI stack is made. The TCPIP stack is made to interpret the, the you know bytes into packets and then below that there's hardware that's like doing a, a analog to digital conversion to figure out what the individual bits are all of this stuff is happening to add or uncover however you want to say it meaning and we're just aggregating and aggregating and digging deeper and deeper until we've got something that we know how to how to handle let's look at the top two levels of this um, the, the top two levels were at the top I had this user creation request. I've abbrevi abbreviated it as user and, um, underneath that we had hash map, right? Which is something that closure gives us. Um, there are operations defined in each of these layers. So one operation we'll want to do on this user is a get username. And we, we, we usually abbreviate that in closure, just using the keyword itself. Um, but notice it is a specific keyword that we know is useful at this layer of meaning. Uh, there's a lot of keywords that won't be useful at this layer of meaning. Another thing we'll do is get password, which we also abbreviate. And then on the lower level, we have the hash map, which uh, has all these things that are relevant to that layer of meaning of, of hash map, right? So we have get, which uh, will get a value given the key and a social, which will associate a value with a key. We can get all the keys out. There's a bunch of these, uh, but these are useful at this hash map layer and not really as useful at the user layer. Now, of course, in closure, we kind of play fast and loose. We go back and forth between them a lot, uh, but, but we can, we can clearly delineate these things and notice that the two keywords are actually um, defined in terms of get. So this hash map that we have, it actually does represent a user creation request and we can operate at it at that layer of meaning, but it's defined in, the ter in terms of things below it. That get, you know, those keywords have a, a, uh, a, a method in them a, a the, that makes them act like a function, but it's actually that method is defined in terms of get. Uh, we can um, define new layers on top of this user layer. So we can define a layer that's sort of how we store the user in the database. And it's gonna have to know about the keywords that are, are expected in that user. And so we'll point arrows to them. Um, and we can also define another layer that's going to handle some login routines. And that's, you know, one of those routines will be called authenticate and it'll take a user and it'll compare the passwords, et cetera. And notice we can not only add layers of meaning just through interpretation, but we can kind of go further and, and sort of the intent of the, the, that we're programming at. The, pro, the intent might be to log in a user it has to, uh, it's, a, it's a higher, more specific intention than just uh, a user record, right? So we're adding meaning both through this, like interpreting data and 
what our code's purpose is. Okay, so I drew this graph and um, when I was writing my book, I came up with a set of three rules for how this graph could actually be drawn, like how you can go do archeology span in your own code and figure out what these layers are. So there's three rules, really simple. Uh, you, you take a function, you look at its definition and you draw a box for every function and then you draw arrows between function A and B if A calls B, right? Then you're gonna have a big nested, like, like big bowl of spaghetti. So you need to straighten it out so that all functions, all arrows point down. So things only call things that are lower than them, right? And then once you've got that, that kind of st starts the stratification process. But of course, some functions are still gonna be able to move up and down uh, because you could stretch the arrows or shrink the arrows. And without violating the rule of a function uh, has to be higher than the function that it calls, you can still, there's still a lot of, of room. So you still have to go through and kind of rearrange things looking for the layers of meaning. So let's go through an example. All right, so here's a kind of standard way to define filter. It's the filter that we're uh, used to. Uh, it's lazy, it's, it's got two cases, it's checking the empty list, and then otherwise it's the, the normal case uh, where it's gonna destructure the first and the rest. And um, if the, it's gonna check the, the first element against the predicate, if the predicate returns true, it's gonna cons on that first element and recurse. Otherwise, it's gonna skip that first element and just recurse, right? And this is very standard definition of filter. And so what we can do is we can kind of go through and pick out all these function calls and not just function calls, we can even use stuff like um, you know, if and let, their, their macros or, or built-ins and uh, we can just you know underline them and then we draw the arrows between them right and so we'll have we'll have uh, filter pointing to all the all these things but then also we could see that if we look in the definition of lazy seek it's going to point to if and if we look at the definition of empty it's also pointing to if so there's going to be arrows sometimes in between the the ones we call as well Okay, so now that we've got this kind of mess of arrows and stuff, we're gonna straighten it out by making all the arrows point down. So we're gonna pull boxes up and down so that they, uh, they straighten out. And so we'll get something that looks kind of like this, right? Um, we had to pull the if down because it was pointed to by things higher up and so it just came down. Um, and, but we, it's still not easy to see the layers, so we can still have some room, notice, to move things up and down. For instance, let is above cons, and I would not say that let is a, is it like has higher meaning than cons. Cons seems a lot more specific. Uh, it's got a lot more meaning in it. It's, it's about a certain kind of data structure, whereas let is a general purpose, like variable, uh, uh, defining a mechanism defined by the language and now when I look at this this is this is design right there's a lot of um, intuition and and interpretation and iterativeness that has to go on here right you might not get it right the first time you might have to look uh, and, and try different ways but you can kind of see here that we're starting to see layers like let and if Built language built-ins, those are at the bottom. And then there's this middle layer with these four things where it's kind of sequence primitives. And then at the top, it's this higher level tool for dealing with sequences. So we can label these uh, different layers of meaning uh, and, and draw boxes around them so to identify them. And that's what we did here. We we had this mess of arrows and, and functions, and uh, we, just, we just arranged them so that we could uh, see these clear layers. And of course, your system, your software is gonna be really big. It's gonna have all sorts of functions that call each other. And you know, no system looks so perfect as this, uh, but 
we can we can understand that there's like going to be from the top from the main function all the way down to the lower language primitives you're going to have this huge tree or it's not really a tree it's a graph of um of these of these functions and we can start to find layers in them all right so we talked before about this function called authenticate and I, I, you know, this is this this is satisfying to me that we can do this, but I want to understand a little bit better what, how does this add meaning? How, you know, are we really at the top? Are we really getting to very specific understandings of our stuff? And how does that work? Um, so I ha we have this function authenticate. Uh, it fetches from the user, uh, so from the database based on the username, and then it compares the password. Now, please, this is not an example of like a secure way of authenticating someone. Uh, don't store your passwords in plain text, for instance. It's just an example. OK, and we see where it fits in way up at the top. We've already drawn the arrows, right? So this login layer has a thing that's pointing to something in the DB layer and also to the user layer. And it fits somewhere in down here. OK. so. How do we know where it goes besides just the things it points to? Because we've got that body that kind of defines like a, it has to be above the DB layer because it's pointing down. But what puts it above? And I would say it's the name of it. The name is what gives it the meaning. Because we've got something, the, the things it calls that it's pointing to, those are kind of anchoring the definition of this in lower layers, but the name is going to be anchoring it above or elevating it above. So for instance, if we called it fetch user compare password, which is not, is technically correct, that's what it's doing, you're kind of just restating what the, uh, what the definition says, right? So there's no actual, there's very little meaning added to this. And, and you see this sometimes, this is considered a, a code smell in a lot of like software design books uh, where you're just kind of restating the implementation. But it's, it's, a, it's a thing that functions can do, which is to give you a shorthand, a name uh, for a large piece of code, right? It's something we can do, but it does not actually elevate it to a new level. And so I think that this is an important idea that, that this function does exactly the same thing. The computer doesn't care. But as humans, we want to somehow elevate the meaning of this beyond its implementation. right? And so that's what's happening with these layers. We're adding meaning at a human la level. So for the readers and writers of this program, uh, we are imbuing more meaning than what the code can, the, the, the definition of it, the body of the function can imbue. All right, so let's review before we move on. Um, there's three rules. You draw every function and you draw the arrows between them uh, based on what calls what. Then you arrange them so all the arrows point down. This kind of starts stratifying, uh, but then you have to do a little bit more intuitional, you know, moving stuff around based on what you feel and what what the meaning you're looking for. The function body anchors the definition in lower layers, and the function name elevates it to a higher layer. This next video is. Dr. Alan Kay in an interview with Joe Armstrong talking about why he liked what the AI lab was doing. I went batshit over in AI is they were the only people in computing that were worrying about meaning. Everybody else was worrying about how to make simple little machines and debug those simple little machines, where the AI people were interested in systems that not only could hold larger meetings, but also could reflect on those meetings. He was blown away because they were the only people looking for meaning.
they were the only people out there in uh, in software in in computer science looking to understand how we make meaning and as humans and to try to use that to make computers do things. Other people were just trying to make simple machines, kind of mechanical, like we need to do X, so let's, let's figure out how to program it. And I believe that this is key to why Lisp has had such an influence on the industry. Even though it's not very popular to actually use it in industry, um, it, relative to other languages, uh, it has looked for a, a real purpose and stepped back and said, what language do we need to achieve that purpose? And the purpose is a big purpose, like a huge vision of like representing human knowledge, human meaning, something like that. And then stepping back and realizing, well, we need to be able to encode these meaning capturing engines uh, which is a thing that Lisp is really good at. Other people are saying stuff like, well, we need to be able to uh, code a mathematical function, uh, do a mathematical calculation, and so we get Fortran, right? Which doesn't have the, 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 the magic that we think of when we think of Lisp. Okay, um, so I think that this, this idea of different layers is cool. There's, there's something missing, but you know, we're just adding a new, like a name, which gives something. There's, there's often things going on that layer that make it more powerful. It doesn't quite explain everything. And so I look to, uh, to, to Jerry, to, to Dr. Sussman, uh, and, and his work on this, uh, because I, I think that they've really uh, done a good job of, of trying to interpret what's going on and explaining it. So uh, I need to give a little background. Uh, in structure and interpretation of computer programs, there are, uh, there's a list of requirements for being a language, right? So you have primitives, you have means of combination, so how do you compose those primitives up into something bigger? And then means of naming. In the book, they call it means of abstraction, but I feel like I'm gonna confuse abstraction with, with generality and meaning. So I, I decided just to uh, be more direct and call it naming. So that's just how you name something so that you can refer to it later. Okay, so here's our filter uh, diagram again. And we're gonna look at the bottom two, uh, right. So here we have language primitives like let and if, and then the layer above it, we have combinations of those primitives. So a combination meaning we're defining a function that uses let and if, and then we're giving it a name. And then in the next layer, we're using those sequence primitives as primitives, we're combining them we're giving them names, but what we're building is actually new means of combination. Okay, so we had these means of combination, the how to, you know, defining a new function and giving it a name, but now map, filter, take, etc. those are actually new ways of combining things. So map lets you combine a function with a list, filter, function with a list, take, yeah, it's a number with a list, but it's a new means of, of building lists. So let's look at this layer. It's got primitives. The primitives are sequences. Those it gets from the layer below. Next. It has means of combination, new means, not just the ones given to it by the language. Map, filter, and take are, are new. And then it has means of naming, which it gets from closure. So you can still name stuff using the lower level closure stuff. So this is actually a language. The tool, the sequence tools form a language. And that is um, actually pretty cool. Now, this is at least according to these requirements of 
structure and interpretation of computer programs, right? That this, that this is a language that we have made at this new level, this new layer. We have a new language for expressing ideas at this layer of meaning. What I wanted to say is like each of these layers could be a language by those requirements, right? They, they all have these things, ways of combining and ways of naming that it gets from the closure language. But that doesn't explain everything because, you know, a couple of keywords, uh, username and password, that doesn't really sound like a very rich language. Uh, it's, it's very, I mean, sure, yes, it's, a, it's, like, it's like saying, well, my dog knows a couple of commands. And so that's a language. And it is, it's a way I can communicate with the dog. But uh, it's, it's not a very meaningful way of, of encoding meaning. And there's, you know, you can't encode new things. You can't teach a dog new tricks by combining those, uh, those commands together into something new and giving it a new name, right? So that's kind of what we're, we're at with those keywords, right? So some layers actually have this other property called the closure property. There's a closure with an S to not confuse it. So here we have, um, we can see some examples of using map, filter, and take. Map takes a list and returns a list. Filter takes a list and returns a list. And take takes a list and returns a list. Okay, so this is, this is the closure property that if, we're, if we squint, we can see that, hey, I can take that list that filter returns and pass it directly to map because it also, it takes the same type. And then the thing that map returns, I can pass that to take. So, you know, we can start with a map and then we can wrap it in a filter and then wrap it in a take. Here's this other thing that we know of, but haven't mentioned yet, but concat actually takes two lists and returns a list. So we can nest another thing and look at all these other tools that this layer gives us, drop, map, cat, distinct, reverse, sort. We can arbitrarily nest these expressions because of the closure property, because the return of one function, it can be used as the argument for another. So we can arbitrarily nest it. And so we, we have this, uh, you know, before we could compose things sort of by, you know, by chance, sometimes something would take the return value of another thing, but uh, also we could, compose things in sequence, but now we've got this arbitrary nesting, which is a property of human language that we can, uh, we can have dependent clauses that have a similar structure as the, the bigger sentence that they're part of. Uh, and this gives us a new dimension of complexity that we can express with these, with our expressions. Uh, and it lets us feel more comfortable uh, when we're expressing stuff. Uh, and, I, and I think that's important because we, um, like in closure, we tend to get comfortable with just hash maps and regular, regular data structures. Uh, in other languages, they might define new types, but we just kind of stick in the hash maps. And I think this explains it a lot that it's just so comfortable to be there because we have all these tools and they're so expressive on their own uh, that we sometimes will just get kind of stuck there. Like why abstract anymore above this? Why add more meaning? Uh, and we can see that hash maps do this. Uh, they have the same property. So a soch takes a map, returns a map, uh, update takes a map, returns a map, merge takes two maps, returns a map. Oh, there's a typo there. But that doesn't explain everything that we do in Lisp. Sometimes we'll nest these function calls and it just gets awkward. It doesn't really seem to uh, give us the expressive power we need. Um, in the uh, Lisp, a, a language for stratified design, 
the authors talk about um, using something like a logic language or a, a rules engine and how these are not easily expressed in nested calls to, to functions. And so we have this ability, like for instance, also, I think outputting HTML within your code, is a common thing we do as web programmers. Um, but if it were nested function calls that we were trying to do, it wouldn't be as, as convenient as what we do with Hiccup. Or for instance, uh, expressing like a, a data log query as nested function calls would be kind of hard. What do we do? We can actually introduce new means of com combination and means of naming and build a whole new language with an interpreter. So we can be at some layer of meaning and say, we need a giant leap. We can't just add a few functions and call it a, a, an expressive language. We want to kind of make this discontinuity and define a new language that will let us express what the meaning we want to express because we need totally new means of combination and new means of meaning. We've already got the primitives, right? We've got the, um, you know, symbols and, and strings and whatever other primitives we need, but we want to be able to express it in a totally different semantics, a totally different meaning. Um, so we write an interpreter or a compiler and that compiler is going to be defined at some layer of meaning and it creates this, I mean, I think of it as a discontinuity because you've kind of made a, a new realm where uh, it's, it's hard to share things between um, and you've got, because the semantics are so different, uh, but you can make this new layer where you've got this totally different meaning with new means of combination and naming. Okay, um, so we've got these requirements for a language, primitives, means of combination, means of naming. Uh, those show that we can actually consider most layers to be new languages. Then some of those layers are gonna have what's called the closure property, which gives us this nesting that is a new dimension for composition and we can make leaps uh, in, in any language, but Lisp makes it really easy to uh, define a totally new kind of language that has different ways of combining and naming and lets us express new meaning. Okay, so I've, I've explained all this stuff about meaning and how, how we do it as programmers, how we build it up. And one of the things we are often doing is uncovering that meaning in a domain. Um, and, and usually we're working for a business that the software we're writing is basically running the business now. And this is a, a, maybe a lofty idea I have, but I have found in my experience that because the programmers are having to wrestle with corner cases and details of representation and definitions in a very precise language, meaning the programming language, they often have a better, more subtle understanding of the business than the non-programmers. Even say the, the, you know, the, the visionaries who started the business. Um, and it's a different kind of understanding, but it's something that programming gives us. And I somehow believe that we will come to understand this more deeply uh, in the future as an industry, that one of the values of, of the programmer is not just to make the software that does what the business needs doing, but who is also a kind of scientist, a kind of uh, theory builder, 
who develops a competitive advantage for the business through a deeper, more precise and nuanced understanding of the domain. And if a business person could rely on that person as a kind of, um, uh, not consultant, but um, like, uh, like the, a business person could ask questions of this programmer, like, does it make sense to consider, let's say, the user to be X, Y, Z? And the programmer could say, well, I don't know how we could express that in our software. And, but we could express this, which is kind of adjacent. And so then the, and similar. And so the, the boss could think, oh, wow, that's actually what I meant. <laughs> and that's a very precise way of explaining it. And this has happened to me in, in conversations in the business where understanding the domain at the level of what do we store in the database? How can we, how do we encode uh, what's ha what the user's intention are, int intentions are as changes in, in the data in the database, this, this understanding has allowed for new ideas of what the business should actually do. This next video is Dr. Gerald Sussman, who's actually in the audience, which is kind of, kind of cool. He's talking about using programming to precisely define physics because in physics often they don't use mathematical notations in a very precise way you kind of have to learn what the symbols mean culturally uh, they're not used the same way that they're used in math and kind of depending on the formula and everything, they use the same symbols, but in different ways. And this is kind of what uh, Sam Ritchie was talking about earlier, which is also kind of cool. It was not planned. Uh, so I'll, I'll let the video play. But I'm going to talk a little bit about that, how programming helps you understand things that are usually written very poorly, no matter how good the authors are. It turns out that the traditional methods of writing these things are terrible. Let's see, what is the problem really? The, the problem in learning things like electrical engineering and physics is that we have to learn several things. They're written, they're expressed in mathematical language, mathematical notation. And mathematicians and, and physicists have shared culture. The reason why I can talk to you and you can understand me at all is because we're almost identical. We have an enormous amount, we're almost identical physically, and we're almost identical in our experiences. I mean, if you talk about the really grand scale of experience, in which, as a consequence, it takes only a tiny little increment of information to produce a big effect in, in trans, con, transferring some information, a big piece of the data structure in my mind to a piece of data structure in your mind, okay? And, as, but anybody who has shared cultures know that it's hard to talk across cultures. And what happens is that, the, that mathematics has shared culture, physics has have shared culture, and the difficulty is that they talk to each other in ways that depend upon the sharing of that culture. Trying to get an introductory student to understand that is very hard because they have to simultaneously learn the culture and the language as well as the content. As I like to say, it's like trying to read Les Miserables when you're learning French grammar. Okay, it's the that kind of problem. Okay, so in this, in this uh, talk, Dr. Sussman was uh, explaining that using programming, uh, pro, uh, encoding the physics, uh, how should I put this? Encoding the phys formulas of physics as programming would clarify uh, what they are mean, what they mean, because physicists will use uh, mathematic notation, uh, but not be precise enough that you can just 
as a mathematician, just read it and know you have to have this shared culture. You have to be brought up in like, well, what do physicists mean when they do this, this symbol? And by having a precise language, like a programming language that, you know, either compiles or it doesn't and it runs and gets the right answer or it doesn't, uh, it forces you to, um, to clarify exactly and precisely what you mean. And uh, so uh, I, I really feel like this is one of those, you know, it might take a thousand years, right? Uh, but, but we will one day uh, look back and having encoded lots of stuff and as programming and feel like, wow, now we have a much clearer and correct understanding of those ideas. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, let's get back down to earth, look at things a little bit more practically. How can we apply this uh, stuff to our own code? Okay, so one thing that I think that this, this, uh, these layers show us is that this idea of layers of abstraction is very confused. I, I was confused until I started drawing this out. Because, you know, we'll talk about like, oh, I'm making a higher layer of abstraction or a lower, you know, we need a lower layer. You know, what does that mean, higher and lower? Uh, and I felt like I was um, not really clear on that. So I wanted to share that, like, maybe why this is confusing. So we have this function called emails of users. And it's going to recurse through this list and, and basically transform a user into a, the user's email. Uh, if, if you're paying close attention, you might uh, see what this, uh, you know, that this, this is the graph for it. And if you're paying even closer attention, you would notice that, hey, that looks a lot like a map. That's just map. So we make map. I haven't changed the graph yet on the right, but the code has changed. Uh, we can just kind of abstract out, extract out this, um, this function where uh, instead of having it hard coded that we're looking for email, we'll pass that in as a function to map, right? And so now we have this nice general purpose uh, sequence tool called map that we can use everywhere. And then emails of users, the definition becomes uh, very one-liner. Uh, and in fact, we probably wouldn't even name this because uh, it's already very clear with just that one line. So let's do the graph. And notice, because emails of users calls map, the arrow has to point down. So, so map has to go between emails of users and the, and the stuff that map calls. And I, I point this out because I've often heard people say, and I, I think I say it still, like we're going to extract out this higher layer of abstraction map. But higher than what? It actually came down out of emails of users. It's still higher than you know, lazy, seek, and empty and all those, but we, we actually pulled it down, right? So this, this shared, thing, this more generic thing got pulled down. So I, I, this to me is just saying like, man, we shouldn't even use the word abstraction because we, we don't really, it's too confusing. Because of that, I, I, I feel like we should be able to uh, maybe clarify our thinking about uh, maintainability and other aspects of our code from this. Uh, so here's this original layer system that we had. And I just want to poll the poll everyone here. Um, which so we have this this spectrum arrow, double arrow on the on the right hand side. So we've we've oriented this top down, up down. What side has of, uh, of this spectrum? Where would we find the functions that are more specific? And where would we find the functions that are more general? I'll just, I'll let everybody maybe think about that for a moment. Maybe write down an answer, share it in the chat. All right, so um, I think this is, this is pretty clear that 
general is at the bottom and specific is at the top. Right. So when we're making, when we're, when we're pulling functions apart into, you know, more general purpose utilities than, and then the functions that call those, we're actually making more general stuff. So it goes down, right? And uh, the language is the more general stuff, like the closure language. It's used by lots of companies and for totally different purposes. And so all that stuff is, is necessarily more general. And then as you go up, things get more specific. The meanings that it can address are more specific and fewer. So for instance, at the top, we just have authenticate. That's like all it can do. This one very special purpose. Okay, so likewise, for maintenance, we can put other spectra. Like what's easier to change, the top or the bottom? I'll, I'll let y'all think about that for a second. Like if I had to make a change somewhere, like change the definition of one of these functions, what would be the one that's easiest to change? And what would be the hardest? So uh, I would contend that uh, the stuff at the top is easier to change. There's fewer things that depend on it, that point to it. Uh, you know, going all the way to the top where you have main, it's easiest to change your main function. It's not going to have uh, an effect on the rest of the code. I mean, obviously it's gonna change your software the most, but it's going to have the least, you know, repercussions on the other bits of code. Likewise, if you change stuff at the bottom, let's say you redefine a soch to do something different, <laughs> all the code above it that points to a soch is now going to break. Uh, and so even if you try to change it to maintain the behavior, maybe you will make a mistake, right? So it's, it's, it's harder to change. Okay, so what is more valuable to test? This might be, uh, this might be harder, stuff at the top or the stuff at the bottom. Um, so I'm gonna argue that the stuff at the bottom is, is more valuable to test. Um, the reason being, it's going to, the, the stuff at the bottom is gonna change less often because it's, it's harder to change. And so the tests are going to last longer, you know, that, that particular test that you're writing for that behavior is going to last longer. And so that test is going to be more valuable. So you write that test for that, basically the stuff at the bottom is unchangeable, you know, all the way at the bottom. If you test that properly, you'll never have to test it again. You'll never have to change those tests. Likewise, the stuff at the top, like let's say main, very top, it is uh, less testable uh, because you're gonna change that a lot. And so now you're gonna have to change your tests all the time. So you're, you're writing a test for it is not as valuable. You still might wanna do it, but it's not as valuable. Likewise, the stuff that everything depends on, like a SOCH, like everybody's program depends on a SOCH at some point, uh, so having a good test for a SOCH is going to be valuable to more people, to more of your code, right? Okay, I think that's clear now. Um, now, what is easier to reuse? This one might be an easier one. What is easier to reuse, top or bottom? I will argue that the stuff at the bottom it's easier to reuse, it's more general. And just by virtue of having more arrows pointing to it, the, to the stuff at the bottom is gonna have more arrows pointing to it. Um, it is just by an ex existence proof that it is being reused more and therefore it is easier to reuse, okay? It's gonna be hard to reuse this authenticate method that you've written in somebody else's software. Um, they might have a different representation of users, but 
if they're using closure, they're probably using hash maps and those, all those things are gonna be reusable. So, and then of course, going lower level down to the language primitives and things, those are obviously being reused by many, many people, many companies all around the world. Oh, okay, my book again, plugging my book again. Uh, you can get 50% off with this code. Uh, it's coming out soon. I've already sent it off to production to finish off. So uh, it'll, it'll be there. Uh, um, I, want to, I want to open it up for questions if we have a little bit of time, uh, because I, I feel like we covered quite a lot and um, we have some excellent resources in the, in the Zoom window. Uh, so thank you so much for, for this. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> we manage. We managed. We managed. Through. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It worked Some, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. It, it seems like an easy job, like clicking slides. It turns out it's not. No. They they no. do whatever <laughs> they want. They're just randomly switching. And <laughs> sorry for that. So I tried my best. Um, but yeah. No, you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> so virtual applause. I know you can like uh, hear it, but I think that was the. Some of us can do it. Um, yes, uh, let's open it up for questions. And uh, um, I think, so I'm not sure if the questions are arriving on the channel because I wasn't able being full screen to like uh, follow that, but I'll be um, quickly doing it. Anyone that wants to raise their hands while I'm uh, like collecting the the questions from yeah go okay yeah please go ahead jerry oh okay uh dirty suspect i was can everybody hear me by the way because it's yes because i had trouble yesterday okay uh i was if you go back to the slide which has a bunch of very complex trees the very large tree diagram i don't know if you can do that but i'll, I'll just it doesn't matter if you can't do it i'll just say that the interesting thing is there are some other decompositions that have not been showed, talked about, which is sometimes a whole branch of the tree is separated from another branch, okay? Mm -hmm. As you go down, there's, big, there's a big chunk that may not be connected to other things. And that's actually very good to say that really what we're talking about is not just one tree of a tower of languages, but in fact, a, a multiple tower of languages because the, the, the branches that are distinct can be thought of as being separate, rather separate languages. Okay, if you had that, right. one, I could, I could show, show you, but from that's okay. Right. From left to right, yes. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. Thanks, Jerry. Um, it's uh, we're not just creating one concept and then getting a more specific version of it and a more specific. We're creating a cluster of concepts. Each one might have its own uh, language for expressing the the nuances of those concepts. And yeah, there's there's going to be definitely different towers for sure. A great a great program is usually a forest of languages. Mm. Great, thank you. For example, Emacs. Right. Beautiful language, a beautiful system. One of the things that Alan Kay talks about is how the objects in Smalltalk were. Uh, we're sort of, I, I call it a nexus or a locus of, of access to multiple algebras. So, you know, there's, there's definitely multiple algebras in, in like real numbers, right? Like there's, there's addition and multiplication. There's all, all these things that real numbers can do. But he was saying like this, um, this object is part of a language for drawing it to the screen. And it's also part of a language for saving it to uh, tape. And it's also part of a language for um, uh, user interface actions. And so there's, and it's all, you know, it's got all these geometric operations that are possible. And so this, this, this one value is part of this, uh, it's part of multiple language trees, you know, in this forest. And it was sort of the nexus of where they all connected up. Uh, 
Elena, do you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. So um, I wonder what you think about test-driven development uh, and sort of little uh, implementations of it, such as writing, uh, figuring out how a function is supposed to work. And I find it helpful in introductory classes when students are writing uh, their functions and I say, if you can't write a test for it, you, you don't know what it's supposed to do. But I also found that it helps in naming because the naming becomes separate from implementation. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's a real experience or sort of an observer bias because that's what I'd like to see. So I was wondering what you can comment on that. Uh, wow. Uh, well, I don't know if I have an answer specifically, but what it makes me think of is, is that um, implementation and naming are definitely different. And over time, your sense of the layers is going to evolve as your understanding of the domain evolves. And so you might implement, you might call something F just to have a name for now, but then realize, oh, this is actually about, you know, fetching a user and, and, and checking the password. So you name it that. And then you realize, no, actually it's part of a higher, higher layer of meaning. We got to call it authenticate. And uh, so to separate them, yes, they're definitely separate. There's an anchor, and then there's the, the name which places it higher. And so you could, you, in theory, you could change each of those independently. Um, and I think this is one uh, form of technical debt. You know, as we write software, you know, we are writing it, it with our current understanding of the domain. And often, you know, even if we're, we're perfectly capturing that current understanding, uh, in, in a month, we might have a different understanding. And often we're not even doing that. We're not writing it perfectly. We're under a deadline and we just get it working. And then we think, well, my, my understanding is it's A is above B and above C, but I just got it working and it's really like A and B and C and they're all kind of like in a jumble. And so then you have to, when you read that code again later, you read this A, B, C jumble, but you have to remember, oh yes, it's really supposed to act like A is above B and C. And so now you have to do this translation and you feel like you're just making all these workarounds to make it work in this way that you understand it's supposed to work and you never get around to cleaning it up. And it's a, it's a form of technical debt. And it's not just technical debt, it's like debt, psychological debt, because that takes brain cycles that you have to do every time you read it. Uh, it's not just like, you know, a cost to, you know, maybe there's bugs or something that are also considered technical debt. It's, it's actually like a, a burden on every programmer who, uses that software. Choosing good names is the hardest job of being a programmer. Yeah. Yeah, we heard that a few times, I think. Caching and good names, um, I think, are the two. Maybe there are more than that. <laughs> um, so we have um, a few questions that I pulled in from um, uh, Discord and in Zoom chat. The Zoom chat came first, so I'm going with that for you, Eric. So. Uh, does this lead to the idea that programmers will eventually just be working in DSLs for whatever domain they happen to be working in? I mean, that sounds like a good, a good goal to me. Um, you know, I could, I, I, I'm, I'm serious about the business competitive advantage idea that I mentioned that you're actually uh, able to have better encoding of a domain than another company. And as, as time goes on, that will compound because you're able to express stuff better uh, than they are, faster or, or however. Um, and it's much more than just like copying a feature, right? It's like we have a better understanding of our user and what is important to our domain, what information to capture and how to represent it. Uh, likewise, whatever other concepts are in your domain. And uh, a DSL, to, to do that, like let's say um, 
you have some DSL for representing like um, accounting concepts, you're writing accounting software, like you might actually be able to express more, uh, uh, more of accounting than they can. They're doing stuff with for loops and you've got a DSL, you know, you're gonna win. Um, uh, I have uh, somebody with the raised hand. Jesus, you want to make your question? Yeah, hello, thank you. Just, I, I want to, to know if this practice in functional programming where there, there is this big section between difficult things and easy things and difficult being things like uh, uh, input output uh, errors and the other side pure functional stuff that, that's like a pattern you see in, in the programming uh, functional programming world is something that can be explained as a, a stratified design or is something totally different um. I, I, I'm having trouble uh, understanding that that first part about um, about yes, bytes so on one side and, the, and functions. Let me see if I excuse my English, please. Uh, no, 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 no problem. Use uh, in functional programming, like in or in the Tarpit paper or the Erlang paper, they always talk about a big, big section, right? You divide your system in two. Like in uh, yeah. half the difficult things, right. uh, typically uh, input output, right? And in the mm -hmm. other side, you have the pure right. world, the functional world. Uh, right. It's kind of an abstraction, but I don't know is if this practice is something that you can describe uh, as an stratified design, or is something probably th totally different. Huh. I think it's totally different. Um, I think that, so, so uh, like a language that, that makes that distinction, uh, a, a, I think a pretty strong distinction between the sort of impure um, procedural things that have to happen, uh, like, and, and in a specific order and with, you know, specific, timings and stuff versus this purely mathematical world where you're just calculating things. Um, I think the, the language that does that the most clearly uh, is Haskell with its IO type. So it uses the type system to distinguish between the two. And um, so they have an entire language, uh, they call it monad, to, and then it has syntactic sugar to, uh, to compose these effects together into sequences and, you know, alternatives and things like that. And, you know, whatever other parallel things happen, that's all done in IO. And uh, so, you know, I don't know if, if, you know, you would find a, okay, no, I, I doubt you would find a layer where all this imperative stuff happens and then another layer where it becomes functional. But you could have, like Dr. Sussman was saying, like different branches, different you know, trees of different languages to describe the two different sides of that. Yeah, yeah it's more vertical, it's true. Yeah. It's true, Yeah. thank you. I think I'm trying to understand it better all, all days. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, there's a, a few other questions coming from Discord. So Ian from in the Discord is asking, do you think that Semantic Web tried to solve part of this problem uh, on naming and related stuff? How does it relate to this problem? So, okay, I don't, um, hmm, I haven't thought that much about that, but I know in Semantic Web, one of the ideas of naming is you're creating a universal name uh, using a URL. Uh, of a domain you control. So like, you know, there's some consensus about the meaning of a name, uh, but it's an arbitrary name. It's not a human level name. And as I argued in the talk, it's the, the meaning 
uh, that a name imbues on a function is is mostly just human. It's it's because it's in English, and uh, we we understand English and the meanings of the words, uh, or whatever language you're using. Uh, that that's why that's why it has meaning. Um, the idea of of a URL, which is not like a human level understanding of meaning. Um, it's nice, it's convenient to be able to kind of universally refer to something, but it doesn't really give it meaning. Hope that answered the question uh, from, from the chat. Uh, another one from Discord. Um, Given your thoughts about the developer programmer working in a business, not just being the person who writes the software, but a kind of scientist who discovers stuff in the domain, uh, maybe with more precision, do we need a better job title? Uh, what that might be? <laughs> uh, yeah, so like I think about programmers now are um, similar to scribes back in the you know, middle ages before the invention of the printing press, um, where you were kind of like this cherished, highly valued person who could read and write. Uh, so, you know, a king might uh, use you as a, as a, as an advisor or, you know, they were, they were valued more, let me put it, they were valued more than just as like a human typewriter, <laughs> right? Like, you know, not a, they, they weren't just secretaries, like take dictation, right? And then just write stuff down. Um, they were seen as access to uh, a world that most people didn't have access to, a uh, world of knowledge, a world of, um, of record keeping and things like that. And so, yes, maybe, Maybe we need to be considered more like that. Like, hey, you're hiring, you're hiring me not just to make your computers like send the right bits, but also to um, to discover your domain. And it, it's we have to start doing it. I don't think we do it enough. Uh, and if we do start doing it, then maybe people will. Um, people will start to appreciate us for that ability. And also we need more people to be programming, just like now we don't have scribes uh, because we're, you know, we have near universal literacy. And so we don't need this like special class of person. Uh, so if, if more people learn to program, perhaps they would not, you know, they would have access to that world as well. Thank you, uh, Eric. I see a hand up. Uh, Egg, do you want to mute yourself? Yeah, uh, hey, Eric. Um, Hello. You mentioned a couple times in uh, that in your conception of this, um, you know, each function as you're as you're stratifying the design, each function always calls functions lower than itself in that design. There. Are, certainly cases where that's not true, right? I mean, every, um, you know, every time we use a declare enclosure of necessity, uh, that's, that's a time when it's not strictly true. Often, I feel like that's a, a code smell, right? Um, but there are times when it seems like it isn't, right? And I'm th I think, for example, of the Metacircular Evaluator, and right. I'm, I'm interested in hearing thoughts from you and or from Professor Sussman on um, how, did, how to distinguish. When is, it, when is it the right thing to not uh, strictly do that? That's a really good question. Um, basically, you're pointing out that I skipped over recursion and uh, mutual recursion. Um, and I did that mostly to simplify the idea. Uh, I, I do think that there are exceptions. They're not as common as, uh, you know, functions that are defined in terms of uh, other things. But I think that it does point to something really interesting uh, where you can 
have cycles in this graph and somehow use something uh, uh you know above you know like something like there's possibilities there i think there's that gets really dangerous when you're trying to define meanings and stuff because you've got just like we don't like uh recursive definitions right <laughs> like when you're defining a, a word in english you don't want to just use another word and then you look up that word and it uses the word you're just at and you have no idea <laughs> it doesn't help you understand the thing uh so there's some sense that it's not great for creating meaning um you can always remove recursion right and like so if you have mutual recursion you can turn it into regular recursion and if you've got recursion uh, you can um, turn it, you know, maybe uh, I'm thinking of like the recursion in map, right? Like you can just say, okay, this is a special case. You have two cases. One case is the empty case and the other case is this recursive case. And um, it's only recursive because the data structure it's operating on is recursive. And so we're defining something in terms of itself, but somehow magic, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cool little magical thing that we're able to make something that, that is de defined in terms of itself. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't have an answer to that. So that's, that's just my little rambling, trying to find something to hook on to. Maybe Jerry has something more to say about that. Yeah, I think, I think that there is a, uh, a bit, a tiny bit missing. You gave a very nice talk, but there's a, a tiny bit missing, which has to do with again the horizontal structure of those trees. Okay, that at any particular level, you can think of that there are it, it locally, there are uh, inter interactions between adjacent members of that of that level. Okay, cooperation. that cooperation, and that's that's essentially what's being talked about here. And that that's pretty essential to making uh, uh, making things work correctly. So you get you know, but, but of course, it might be that some piece of it is um, is local in the sense that it doesn't that that does not stretch across the entire width of the big of your big tree. It's a chunk, okay. And that chunk, there, those little sub pieces are are are, are units that are part of a, a language level that's being that you use at a higher level and you put defined in terms of a lower level. So one way to think about that is that tightly coupled subsystems that are loosely coupled to their neighbors are in fact what's going on. Okay. It's okay to have such tightly coupled subsystems so long as they are well defined. And in fact, mm -hmm. that's a major portion of the of the design process in building a, a forest of languages. Right. Thank you both. This, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just saying thank you. Yeah, I really like this idea of, um, you know, things having to be well defined. They're often not at first while we're still exploring. And um, sometimes as we build up, we realize that we've kind of cemented in because we built on top of it. It's harder to change the stuff below that we want to change this thing at this layer because we realize there's a better definition there's a better way to define this but then that means we're going to have to change everything that comes above it and you know that's i i feel like that's uh it's a challenge that we have in our industry because business changes fast we need the business to like be you know make enough money to survive and so we often come out with a very, we, we, we release our prototypes basically, and we have to uh, correct them as we go, as we, uh, as we learn. And that's hard because the stuff that is deep in there, that is the core of the meaning, like, you know, above the, there's this huge layer of like UI stuff that doesn't, that's, that's important for a business, but like, it's assuming that the stuff below it is well-defined and, and as meaningful. 
And a lot of times we want to change that and we'd have to change everything above it. And it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. That's why we have to have good dependency structures. Um, yeah, if I can plug like a, an, an idea that remembers me of, um, um, and I'm asking maybe the audience to see if there are other systems designed like that, but it remembers me of uh, um, uh, a project from Richiki that uh, is still in his repo. I just uh, um, forgot his name at the moment. I'm trying to like look it up. Codec with a Q, um, where um, essentially he uh, can drive, or he can draw a list um, uh, like in memory a map of the dependencies of uh, all the namespaces into the functions. Um, and this is done on top of Git, but you know, it could be mm -hmm. done like on top of uh, any other sources, I guess. And I was thinking that uh, I think there was an idea that for this uh, uh, system to be part of the compiler, the closure compiler itself. So when this list uh, loads, um, the map of all the dependencies of this DSLs that are forming is kept somewhere in a like a on, on on a database on the side and this database can be of course like a, a very small system and uh, then at this point when you change something in one part of the system you have a way to track all the places where uh, this little dsl or system was uh, involved um i don't know if anything was done um like other than experimental some line some experimental language that includes this concept um, of uh, yeah, internal dependencies oh. tracking. You know what it reminds me of? There's a language called Unison. Um, and Unison uh, is a language built with the versioning at the function level. So, you know, when we use Git, uh, it's, it, we version and it includes a bunch of changes and it's kind of like looking at the files, right? So it's these diffs of files. Um, but what unison does is like let's say you redefine a function it does a hash of the code tree that defines that function of the body of the function and uh, refers to that hash so that hash becomes a universal uh, uh, pointer to that code and to that version of the function for all time because it's it's probably not going to collide and so the other code that refers to it can refer to the old version while you change it to this new version, which is going to get a new hash because it has a different, you know, different code. Um, I, I think that's a really cool idea is to, to, you know, semantically encode in the language a semantics for, um, for versioning that's safe right? Because your old code can still run because it's pointing to the old version of the function. And, and now you can redefine it and then define course, new but, stuff in terms of the new one. But of course, that doesn't help you with the fact that you want to, if you want to adjust the, the higher level code to fit the newer version, okay, you just this will need the dependency structure saying, say it allows you to track it, track down the who depends upon this. Right. Right. So that's the that's something we need in languages and systems. That you know, how much per, what percentage of our lives is spent maintaining systems because they have version skew? A lot of that is has to do with a lot of that has to do with tracking the dependencies are not tracked well. Right. Also, you mentioned that you'd be able to see that it was a different version, but the different version might not affect any um, code that uses it. It might just be that you noticed a little inefficiency and fixed it. That's right. Something like that, and, and the other, the, the code that uses it doesn't really have to know about that. So that changes the spec. It doesn't change. It doesn't, it doesn't change, change the, spec. the spec, right? Right. And all that stuff is really uh, like open problem, right? How do you say that these two functions have the same outward behavior um, when their code is different? Like that's like that's a hard problem. Sure. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking. Um, if I don't know, uh, there are there's probably another question or two. Uh, do we want to take them, uh, Eric? How do you feel? Uh, uh, yeah, I could go for a few more minutes. 
few more minutes and then uh, because we are like uh, beyond time but you know this is kind of a open uh, meeting and now <laughs> um, okay so this is the genesis of this code these ideas in your talk um, come from taming your own code or while trying to grok someone else code or none um, well I feel like picking apart the question uh, it's it's uh, both so you know it's working with systems that I'm experimenting with and how to encode meaning, what kinds of meanings I want to be able to express, but also working at companies where it's a shared code base, right? So I'm reading other people's code and, and modifying, building on top myself. And so, yeah, it's other people's code as well. And one last, I think, uh, is, is there, is there a representation trap when creating a domain model where overloading terms forces context overload on the future maintainers? Uh, yeah, and, and I think we see this cost in Clojure uh, quite often, um, if I understand the question correctly. So, you know, I mentioned how in Clojure it's very comfortable to stay kind of at the level of hash maps we kind of venture up a little and we do some stuff assume we like we know at this point in the code i've got a user i can do certain things to it uh with the, you know certain i can expect certain keys um but then we then we associate and we we merge it and do some other stuff to it like it's just a data structure and this this is normally fine the problem is this is a common complaint in closure where people say I don't know what keys I have. What like what what kind of data can I expect, uh, or, or what kind of data should I pass to this function? What does it expect to have? And what if I'm in this function? What what can I expect to be called with? Uh, and what I what I think the problem is is this jumping between layers. Um, at some point, so when you're when you're first starting your system, it's really convenient. Because this layer of like what a, what a user is is like poorly defined. It's 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 changing all the time, and so you want to be able to use it as a hash map, no problem, right? If you had to define a type at that point where you're not sure yet, you'd be constantly changing the type, and it would be very inconvenient. But then at a certain point, you do know what you need, and it. It, the the problem reverses where like you know what you need in a user but you've treated it like like a hash map where anything could be in there at any point and so now uh the the problem is i wish i had it more strict i wish i had defined it somewhere and could rely on that because i've got all this other code relying on it and there's so much code i forget what needs what uh, and so I, I think that this is, this is one of those classic problems where we've we made it easy at the beginning, but it's easy to make a mess that is hard to clean up later. Um, and I think people would, some people would disagree with me. They would say, well, it's, it's all just data, just leave it as hash maps as, um, and, and never go to the next layer. <laughs> never go, never define a user entity, you know, just always think about this is just a collection of keys and values, with, you know, certain subset of possible keys and certain subset of possible values. And it could also have more keys that you're not expecting. Uh, but um, I've seen the problem firsthand many times where people start writing long comments about like, this is what, you know, this is the kinds of keys we're gonna pass to this function and it has to return a key, you know, and they start using spec to try to, to figure out what's what. And so I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a real issue. And I, and I think that this explains it. It's the, the two freely jumping up and down. And at some point you wanna lock it down and say, we're gonna stick at this level and stop treating it like a hash map. All right, um, well, uh... Uh, Eric, thank you very much. And uh, like, thank you. Uh, 
we we uh, we did our best to to get your like a keynote running anyway. So uh, the recording might have a couple of discontinuities. Then you let me know if uh, we're going to okay or not, depending on how good it is. Um, I just want to thank uh, you, um, everyone uh, who attended the keynote, uh, Jerry and Julie for like uh, being so nice and uh, like uh, commenting and asking questions yesterday and today.